Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two. And to kick us off, we've got uh, Gottlieb. Can you hear me? Am I on? So oh, there we are. Uh, we've got Gottlieb um, starting us off. Gottlieb is an agronomist from Germany, but for the last 30 years, he's been in Portugal, where he did his PhD. And he's now the professor, uh, a professor at the University of Evora. And he's also president of the European Conservation Agriculture Federation. Now, his study on the impact of CA as a system to be adopted is a main area of focus for him. And today, he's going to be talking about conservation agriculture in Europe, the history, the current status, and dynamics, challenges, and perspectives within the CAP. So there we are. Over to you, Gott. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Cherry family uh, to be here and to speak to you today. And I really want to congratulate uh, the Cherries uh, for organizing such an event. It's unique, I think, now in Europe. And uh, they are doing a really uh, great job. And I think, well, it's, it's not only a no-till show and conference, but I must say from what I saw two years ago and this year, it's really a conservation agriculture conference because it's uh, covering everything around uh, sustainable soil management. Uh, and this is actually the idea of conservation agriculture. It's not only no-till because no-till is only uh, a part of this system. So uh, I would like uh, to talk to you about uh, agriculture in Europe. Well, I'm, as uh, you've heard, I'm the president uh, of the Conser European Conservation Agriculture Federation now for quite some years. And uh, well, we uh, well, are trying to do uh, uh, our job in order to promote, and uh, I will still uh, tell you this, you see, uh, these are our uh, member associations all around Europe. Uh, from up uh, in Finland down to uh, the south, in Turkey even, and uh, altogether it's uh, 16 member associations uh, we have uh, right now. Well, we are a non-profit association founded in uh, 99 and based officially in Brussels, but uh, practically uh, it's uh, more the Spanish association uh, that is hosting our, our uh, premises and uh, the working office. Well, you see here uh, ECAF uh, and uh, national association members. Well, we uh, envisage a broad membership with practical focus, uh, 16. We have already multidisciplinary experts and specialists from academia, academia researchers and technicians. But uh, we are really proud of having uh, mostly uh, practicing uh, innovative farmers to be the members of our uh, national associations, which themselves are then members of, uh, of ECAP. You see our objectives are the promotion of the concept of conservation and agriculture throughout Europe. It's obvious uh, to be the European platform for exchange uh, of information and experience on conservation agriculture. And altogether we would uh, like to be or want to be also a, a framework for sustainable agriculture as a whole. Uh, why? Well, you all know uh, since uh, quite some years uh, there are constant changes in the demands and, uh, uh, of land use and farming. And uh, well, we all know that traditional farming uh, approaches, practices do have severe uh, problems, drawbacks. And this is actually the reason why we, uh, why we insist in conservation agriculture. Uh, for uh, many reasons. And we are uh, very much convinced that conservation agriculture does really match the demands uh, of uh, sustainable agriculture in a holistic sense. It's not only, well, often uh, people uh, mistake sustainability, it's just uh, environmental. But no, it has to be a holistic uh, approach. It has to be uh, economically viable. It has to be social, uh, socially feasible and so on. So what about CA in Europe? When did it start? Well, you all know uh, about the severe dust uh, storms and dust bowls in US that triggered, uh, well, in the 30s, 40s in uh, uh, USA, the uptake of conservation tillage. Uh, here in uh, Europe, it was a bit later. 
uh, there were some early experiences, uh, mainly uh, done by scientists uh, in, in Europe, uh, whereas elsewhere it was much more driven, I must say. Uh, the initial uptake or the initial experiences were much more driven by, by farmers, but in Europe it uh, was uh, mainly uh, the scientific uh, uh, community that started off, uh, and here you see uh, the first experiences, mainly in trials, uh, as we, I can, uh, start, uh, I can tell you this, because it was me who started in Portugal, actually, the uh, first experiences on uh, conservation agriculture. And here you have the uh, different uh, references uh, reporting the first experiences on conservation agriculture. Well, they were not all of them were uh, positive. We must say both in Spain and Portugal, they were very positive right from the beginning, but elsewhere, especially in Netherlands, in the Netherlands, they had uh, quite bad experiences. Uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly why, mainly, uh, be mainly be eventually because of uh, some sandy soils that were not, uh, uh, well, uh, appropriate for uh, starting uh, with direct drilling. But, uh, okay, uh, let's go on. Uh, the early uptake was actually in Europe, then by farmers, was actually driven uh, by the need uh, to reduce costs, both for labor, uh, fuel, machinery, uh, and of course it was assisted uh, in the early days uh, by the appearance of availability of herbicides. Uh, but still, uh, the experiences, as I told you, not only by the, not only by the uh, scientists, but also by farmers, were uh, uh, quite different in the different uh, uh, European countries. For example, uh, no-till uh, was right away uh, adopted uh, in UK, in Finland, in Spain, when they started uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, conservation agriculture, whereas in other countries, for example, Denmark, Germany, uh, it was mainly the reduced tillage approach that uh, took off. Uh, and in fact, UK was really the lead country in the early 80s. I guess you may remember this. Uh, and it reached almost 300,000 hectares in the early 80s already. But then, as you may know all, uh, it was the straw burn ban that uh, cost, uh, well, uh, farmers to, to leave and uh, no-till uh, practice because of wheat problems. So uh, then it went down uh, to a very few uh, hectares. Uh, well, the concept of CA in, um, in Europe uh, was mainly focused on the reduction of till tillage intensity. Uh, it was only later when the focus also uh, came to uh, the other two principles of CA which are, as you all know, permanent soil cover and crop rotation. Uh, and still today, uh, well, in many, in some regions at least, uh, still the focus still uh, is mainly on the reduction of tillage intensity, forgetting about the other uh, two principles, and they are crucial for the success of uh, conservation agriculture. Uh, in the early days, uh, the application of uh, the conservation agriculture principles in perennial crops uh, were completely forgotten, were absent, actually. Today, we do have, uh, especially in South European countries, we do have great uh, uh, acreages uh, under, uh, in perennial crops using uh, CA principles. That is mainly based on the uh, cover, soil cover, uh, in the intero of uh, permanent uh, crops in orchards, in, in mainly in olive orchards, uh, and also, uh, well, based on a gr great diversity of species, either through natural vegetation or through zone uh, vegetation. Then, uh, well, we must actually say that uh, the foundation of ECAF was a logical, uh, well, result of all uh, of the approaches in different countries in Europe, and uh, in 1999, uh, 99, we started uh, founding uh, this uh, European Federation based on these seven uh, national associations. And right away in 2001, we organized the first World Congress on Conservation Agriculture. Uh, last year, there was a, the seventh already in Argentina, and the next I will uh, uh, talk later on the next one. 
And uh, then in uh, the uh, early uh, 2000, uh, we had also uh, agri-environmental measures within the CAP that assisted and helped to uh, promote and to, uh, at least in some, in some countries, to promote the uptake of conservation agriculture. So these are, uh, well, it's more or less the history. And from these figures, you can see that uh, the availability of funds, of, uh, well, subsidies, to promote conservation agriculture were very, very much important uh, to, uh, to uptake conservation agriculture. You see here, in Spain, they launched a uh, agri-environmental measure in 2006, and uh, well, then uh, the area uh, and the number of farmers and the area that adopted CA measures in annual crops and CA measures in woody crops, uh, these were the numbers of farmers and uh, the total acreage uh, was this, and you see here, uh, this led to, uh, to an uptake of uh, CA in uh, annual crops. Here you can see from uh, in 2009, it was around uh, no-till, 274,000 uh, hectares to almost double in 2011. The same happened in Portugal. Uh, they uh, launched uh, an environmental measure in 2004, and immediately, the uptake was uh, tremendous, you see, from 2004 to two 2005, uh, in uh, uh, direct drilling in annual crops, well, uh, increased 240% and in perennial crops, 100%. Uh, so the importance of CAP, of measures promoting sustainable farming practices, is really uh, important. The same happened in, uh, in Italy, actually. You see here, I know from these regions that they got uh, quite some subsidies, uh, only in these regions actually, because subsidies can be, or nationally, or as in Spain, regionally. Uh, in Italy, they are also regionally uh, attributed. And these regions in, uh, in Italy got these uh, promotional measures for the uptake of, of no-till and conservation agriculture. And you see here, uh, uh, the uptake is much higher than in regions where there were no such me measures. Uh, well, throughout Europe, uh, here you have a, a list of, uh, well, area under, under conservation agriculture. This was the situation uh, early in the early 2000s, uh, you see here. And then uh, comparing to uh, other years, uh, and the last, uh, well, uh, monitoring was in 2015, 2016. You see here, if you take the total acreage 100% uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we uh, succeeded to increase by 221%, uh, uh, or well, uh, by 121%, actually, to be uh, sure. So uh, regarding, uh, this is uh, an overview uh, done by Eurostat in 2010, and here you can see, and this corresponds more or less while we try to confirm but it corresponds more or less to the figures that we are uh, collecting, at least from our member states. But this was done uh, all across Europe, and you see here the different uh, percentages of uptake. Uh, it confirms actually that in Finland, uh, in Finland, uh, the percentage uh, of uptake is highest. It's not the total acreage, but the percentage of, uh, of annual cropland that is under no-till, that is under conservation agriculture, is uh, highest. Well, I don't know whether you confirm, can confirm this uh, for Scotland, uh, but uh, also uh, in Denmark, some regions are uh, quite uh, much using uh, no-till. This is uh, in Central and Southern Europe. You see here the Italian regions, but also Spain has uh, quite uh, some regions. Again, depending on the availability of, um, of measures, of, uh, of funds, they are have higher or lower uptakes. Uh, altogether, uh, you see here the, the EU 27. It's not because uh, UK is already out. Uh, in 2010, uh, they were still in. But uh, the, another country was missing uh, in 2010 and a few other countries. And actually, it confirms, you see here, no-till, the highest percentage we can find here uh, in Finland, which is... Uh, almost uh, 12, 13 percent, 12 percent, and uh, all, but there are a few other countries uh, like Estonia, 
but also here uh, Romania and also uh, Denmark uh, are quite uh, well, well ranked in the uptake of no-till. So uh, what are the actually the European efforts? And this is always uh, well, uh, a question. Uh, how does uh, CAP, and we all know that CAP uh, is really ruling uh, what farmers are doing today, but what uh, does EU do to uh, address soil degradation and conservation? Well, there have, have been many, many efforts actually through uh, uh, different approaches. One of them was, uh, of course, and you may still remember, the attempt uh, to uh, create uh, a soil framework directive uh, in 2000, it started in 2002, uh, and uh, they came up with uh, several reports, uh, six reports altogether, here are only two, uh, uh, with the outcomes of these uh, soil thematic strategy. But then, uh, well, you all know there were a few countries that blocked the so-called uh, soil uh, framework directive. And now it's, uh, well, it's gone, actually. It's off the table. But I think there is a kind of, uh, well, Renaissance uh, within the European uh, Parliament. There was also this, uh, well, uh, GRC, Joint Research Center, a study, uh, so-called uh, so SOCO, Soil Conservation. And, uh, well, they uh, came up with uh, several fact sheets uh, around uh, soil conservation, what is possible, what should you do to, uh, well, address organic matter decline, salinization. You will know the soil threats, I guess, but I will come back to them. And uh, also, they mentioned there already <coughs> conservation agriculture, and this was one of the uh, good things of this project, that conservation agriculture was officially, uh, let's say, uh, uh, recognized as uh, soil uh, promoting, uh, soil conserving uh, management practice. You see, uh, EU spent a lot of money, really, millions and millions, in research regarding uh, soil and soil conservation, here you have a few projects uh, within the uh, framework program 6, 7 and uh, 2020. Uh, also a few live projects, uh, I will come back to this one, where uh, ECAF also uh, played a, a decisive role. Uh, I myself, in, I'm involved in this one, which is still running. So uh, this was actually, uh, the, uh, are the efforts, and were and are the efforts the, of EU to address uh, soil conservation. But what does CAP really want from agriculture? They want everything, actually. They want uh, agriculture to produce, to be productive, to uh, be competitive, to guarantee a good farm income. They want to conserve the environment, biodiversity, but also uh, want to have uh, climate action, which is nowadays actually the battleship of the EU, climate action and also a diversity of rural areas and natural constraints. Well, uh, they want all this, and this was actually uh, where the, the objectives of the last CAP reform, defined in 2012, 2013, and to be introduced in 2014. Uh, but, uh, well, objectives are very patient. You, you can define them, but how to reach them, I think it's all, uh, almost like to, uh, well, to look for such an animal. So the uh, an all in one product, you see, uh, they know what they want, but how to get it, it's almost impossible. So coming back to the soil threats that were identified, identified within the soil thematic strategy, you see here uh, they came up with this list, uh, and well they uh, gave some uh, priority to a few of them, especially erosion, decline in organic matter, and also soil compaction. Uh, were uh, the pri priority ones, uh, and then, well, but what did they do after that? Uh, I will show you in a minute. Soil erosion, you see, this is, uh, well, uh, a map, a global map of the risk of soil erosion. <coughs> okay, fine, this was uh, done by OECD, uh, or the International Soil Reference and Information Center, but what is striking here, well, is first of all that uh, we have a lot of red areas, okay? Red is area of serious concern and area of some concern. And uh, well, the green, okay, we are, have also quite some. But what is actually shocking, 
looking at this uh, figure are these figures here. You see, if you consider stable terrain an area where you can allow or where you allow soil erosion at a rate of almost 11 tons per hectare in a year, uh, this is really incredible. Because we all know that soil formation is at its best let more or less one ton per hectare in a year. And if you consider soil loss of almost 11 tons as stable terrain, then I don't know uh, where's uh, the sustainability in this. So it's really uh, an issue. Uh, it's also an issue, you may not be aware of it, but it's a real issue in Europe at our front door. You see here, this was a report, I was really shocked uh, reading this. It was a notice launched uh, 1st of September 2015, also by GRC, Joint Research Center. Almost 1 billion tons of soil is lost each year by water erosion. 1 billion tons. So, and this would correspond to one centimeter of topsoil of twice the area of Belgium, which is 60,000 square kilometers. Uh, you see, this is crazy. And, well, if you look around, you can find all, all around uh, these pictures, you see? Soil erosion everywhere. And this is really uh, something that, uh, well, has to be addressed. You see here, and uh, unfortunately, the soil that is lost from the field is not stopping at the uh, border of the field. It's going further. You see it here in this uh, lake, in this reservoir, uh, provoking this uh, silting. Uh, silting here, you see. You have here, it goes into the rivers. You have here River Thames. Yesterday we heard, uh, in the morning we heard uh, how they uh, deal with the, well, turbidity uh, of water uh, in, in water treatments. Here, Thames, Tiber in Rome, but also into the ocean. You see here, and to see it better, I uh, amplified it a bit, sorry. You see, this is UK, correct? And I once showed this uh, slide in Brussels to an official uh, at the EU. He said, well, it looks like Britain is bleeding. Well, it really is. It really is. If you lose these topsoil uh, every once in a while. Regarding CO, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, agriculture, we know all agriculture is also a contributor to the emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, apparently, only 10%, like, uh, well, according to this figure, only uh, around 10% is coming from agriculture. But we must not forget that these 10% is only due to nitrous oxides and methane. They do not consider, although it says here, agricultural soils, they do not consider the CO2 lost from soil organic matter mineralization. Okay? Because this is a part. Uh, but you see here what is actually going on uh, regarding soil organic carbon in, in, uh, in Europe. You see here, this was uh, an exercise done by the Smart Soil Project. Uh, the balance on arable land in uh, here, you see here everything which is uh, orange and red, and there are quite some areas, has a clear decline in soil organic matter. And uh, soils at risk regarding soil organic matter, both either, the, here the areas of uh, uh, risky areas are even uh, bigger, because it's not only uh, because uh, soils lose, soil organic carbon, uh, but it's also because soil organic carbon is very low, especially here in the southern Mediterranean uh, uh, countries, soil organic matter levels are really low. We have often soils with less than 1% of soil organic matter. The situation in Denmark, you see here, we have soils here, and these two, so these are uh, different soil types here, five, six, and seven especially the five and six are those are the the loamy soils and the the clay or silt soils which are mostly used for arable farming and they found here in the period between 886 and 2008 at yearly decline a yearly decline of 
well, around 400 kilograms of carbon, this is carbon, not solid organic matter, carbon per year. So it's huge, a huge amount that is lost. The same in Belgium. This study shows clearly that uh, the evolution of percentage of arable soils short in soil organic carbon, I'm not uh, quite sure now what they consider being short in organic carbon, but uh, the criteria is the same both in 82 and in 2004. And you see the percentage at, in all soil types is increasing. So clear uh, sign of loss of soil organic matter. The same here in England. This study is, uh, well, you see here, between 79 and 95. The percentage of soils uh, with lower or soil organic matter is increasing, whereas the area of soils with high organic matter is decreasing. The same here in France. I think you, we find more uh, black spots than gray spots. So uh, actually, looking to the, at this and bearing in mind the soil thematic strategy and the main uh, threats, I think we all must uh, question ourselves whether this practice is still good agriculture and environmental condition. So what to do? Uh, earthworms also as a main biodiversity indicator. You see here, well, this is uh, not uh, a real soil, as of course, this one, yes. But if you uh, look for earth, earthworms and an, on, under a no-till soil, you find this amount per square meter. And if you look to a plowed soil, you find this amount of earthworms, okay? Compaction, also an important issue. You see here, well, normally we look on top of the soil, we don't see compaction. But if we, we look underneath and, uh, well, take uh, some time to identify the compacted uh, zones, you can all find such signs of uh, compaction. And this is compaction not, not by wheels of the tractors only, but also by tillage implements. So I would say that out of these eight soil threats, at least the red four ones, it's agriculture itself, traditional agriculture, that is causing these soil threats. So uh, it's an issue to be addressed, of course, because it's also uh, well, affecting yields. You see here, this is a study, uh, well, was published in 2010, uh, looking at the evolution of, uh, of yields in uh, cereals. And it clearly shows that in Europe, by the end of the last century, yields started to stagnate. But why, actually? We have better inputs. We have uh, better technology. What is missing? I would say it's the basis for crop production, it's, which is the soil. So CA approaches to overcome drawbacks of conventional agriculture. You see here a CAP, the famous, the famous NX4, uh, launched in 2005, uh, indicating that soil erosion should be uh, approached by reducing, uh, by guarantee minimum land management, uh, retain terraces, minimum soil cover, Soil organic matter standards for crop rotation were applic applicable, arable stubble management, and so on. But, well, these were only, uh, well, uh, wishes. Nobody actually forced farmers to, uh, and member states to uh, implement such me measures. Then they, well, they increased a bit the requirements, coming up with the statutory uh, management uh, regulations and also the so-called GAIEX, especially 4, 5, and 6. GAIX is good in agriculture and environmental condition. Uh, again, minimum soil cover, minimum land management reflecting site-specific conditions to limit soil erosion, and maintenance of soil organic matter level through appropriate practices. But which ones? It was up to the member states to define this. And the same was uh, in the last uh, reform of CAP, the greening measures. You all know the three principles that has to be followed. But actually, what is the added value regarding soil threats and climate action? Uh, is it carbon sequestration and increase of biodiversity on 5% of agricultural land? If you could have it on 100% of agricultural land, in case you practiced conservation agriculture. 
So uh, this is what we uh, did, uh, ECAF, we launched uh, in 2012, we launched uh, this booklet uh, alerting uh, EU, uh, the Commission, about uh, the fact that CA would actually be the most promising approach to meet CAP objectives. And while well, we continue this, but it's not only CAP objectives, it's also uh, many of these uh, sustainable uh, development goals can be met uh, at least partly through the application of uh, conservation agriculture. The same happens, and recently the European Soil Partnership launched uh, the uh, voluntary uh, guidelines for sustainable soil management in order to address all these threats. Well, they uh, hardly mention conservation agriculture in some of them, whereas conservation agriculture really could address most of those uh, threats. And uh, they, well, they know it, but the issue is they always say, well, conservation agriculture could, but if you reduce herbicide input. So, uh, well, we also tried to, uh, well, we uh, congratulated this fellow here, which was the former uh, French agriculture, uh, Minister for Agriculture. He actually launched the so-called four per mil uh, initiative. I don't know whether all of you are aware of this initiative, which uh, means that in soils we should achieve at least a four per mil increase of soil organic matter stock or every year. This would be uh, sufficient to uh, meet the climate uh, goals uh, set up in uh, Paris, uh, yeah, the COP20 uh, in Paris, uh, I think it was in three years ago. So uh, we also, well, but with regard to climate action, we recently launched also uh, this booklet. It's a study of the potential of CA to uh, mitigate and to also to adopt to climate uh, change, to mitigate climate change and to adopt it. And for that, uh, well, we, we underline actually uh, the need to do arable farming, mimicking uh, natural soil conditions. It's only possible to store carbon in the soil if you apply these principles of permanent soil cover, minimum soil disturbance on agricultural land. And it's possible, as you all can see out there, uh, and there we actually uh, show in this booklet that uh, you only uh, can achieve uh, climate uh, mitigation through a uh, reduction, clear reduction of these gas emissions and the promotion of sequestration in the soil. Sorry, because if you do this, you literally burn soil organic matter. You do re really burn it. But if you do this, as you all know, you, it's really the only way you have to increase soil organic carbon in the soil. Minimum soil disturbance, cover crops, mulch, and so on, and so on. And in this study, we, uh, well, well, we made some exercises. You, it's uh, available on our website. You can uh, get it in details. But we found out that in annual crops, we could uh, achieve these figures. Uh, I will come up with a, a global figure right now, uh, especially in the Mediterranean areas, but also in the eastern uh, in the continental areas, uh, there's a huge potential actually to, uh, to sequester carbon in the soils. Regarding uh, permanent crops, uh, the potential is mainly because perennial crops you find mainly in, uh, in the Mediterranean uh, regions. Uh, there's a huge potential. Altogether, actually, we could uh, sequester in annual crops this amount and in permanent uh, crops this amount, summing up 190 megatons of carbon dioxide per year. And this is almost 50 times uh, what a, a coal-fired uh, power plant uh, is emitting every year. We uh, are also involved in uh, these live projects. Uh, this one is uh, Live Plus AgriCarbon. It's in the area of, well, climate action. And uh, this project recently won uh, well, almost an Oscar, but won an award of the best li uh, cl uh, life project uh, in, the climate, uh, in the climate action area. We are involved also in others. This is uh, privately fi financed and uh, we have here, I already saw here a few farmers that are uh, practically involved in this project in SPIA, uh, which is monitoring uh, indicators on farm uh, in order to measure uh, the 
performance in terms of sustainability. And we are really glad that we have uh, farmers uh, in several <coughs> European countries uh, where we can uh, measure these uh, different, different sustainability indicators in order to come up, uh, well, to see whether there's an improvement. And of course, we are looking also at, at CA practices, whether they are capable to improve these uh, sustainability indicators. Still another one, still running, it's Climagri. It's also a live project. Well, I don't want to go into detail. You can have a, a look at this uh, website and you can find everything on, uh, on the ECAF website, which is uh, rather easy to find. We are also very much involved in advocacy actions uh, with MEPs uh, in the European Parliament. Here uh, we are, uh, well, these are two MEPs that uh, well, helped us also to, uh, to promote the so-called written declaration. Uh, a written declaration in the EU Parliament is uh, a tool uh, to eventually uh, force uh, the uh, European Commission to take action on a certain subject. So uh, we promoted this written declaration which was uh, drafted and then uh, sent to all uh, MEPs, all, uh, well, uh, all MEPs actually, and they could vote or not uh, favorably for this written declaration. Well, many, many normally even do not vote any written declaration, whether they are against or uh, for it. They just consider uh, this as a non-effective tool. But still, you see here the result of the, of the voting. We, at least uh, out of 742 uh, European Parliament members, we got at least 139 uh, positive answers supporting this uh, initiative, this written declaration. And you can see here that, uh, well, especially Portugal and Spain uh, got the most, uh, well, <laughs> the most votes, uh, even while well, we would have to have 50% uh, positive votes of all in order to force uh, the EU Commission to take action. Uh, well, here you have UK, well, five, we could get the vote of five, the same amount as we got in Ireland, actually. Astonishing. So, uh, well, still, uh, how to integrate uh, CA and CAP? Well, we already proposed this uh, during the last uh, discussion of uh, the upcoming uh, CAP reform. Uh, well, we said that, well, uh, conservation agriculture should be considered as organic farming is, as equivalent to the greening. So if someone practiced CA, uh, there was no need to, uh, to actually, well, to, uh, to fulfill the greening requirements, you see. But for this, actually, we would need a certification scheme for CA. Well, we are still thinking about it. We are not sure whether it's uh, easy to, to handle it, whether we get an agreement uh, all around Europe how to define exactly what CA is and what it is not. And that's a problem. Uh, we also proposed another alternative which would include the, uh, in these three principles of the greening uh, another two principles of conservation agriculture. And farmers could actually choose from this menu from a five uh, courses menu, uh, their, uh, their options. Uh, and of course, we also uh, insisted to, uh, well, to suggest uh, well, uh, the commission to uh, recommend to the member states, because this is up to member states in the second pillar, you see, uh, to convince them to, well, to go forward in considering uh, CA promotion, uh, agri-environmental measures uh, in the in the second pillar options, for this uh, we sh they should define criteria and indicators to monitor and reward farming practices according to their delivery of ecosystem services. But for this, uh, they should also increase second pillar budget. But you know, member states are not very fond of uh, increasing second uh, pillar budget because second pillar is co-financed by them, whereas first pillar is financed 100% by the EU. And uh, well, also uh, we suggested to include uh, temporary incentives, at least for the uptake, for the start, uh, the, for the kickoff of CA uh, in this. So uh, the new CAP, well, uh, recently, well, two weeks ago or three, uh, they launched uh, the new ideas, well, the well, uh, framework. 
uh, of the new CIP, uh, quite interesting things there. Uh, well, specific climate and environment objectives are these three. Uh, what is actually uh, changes, uh, changing, and these are three key changes between the current and the, and the future one and the proposed one, is, uh, well, that uh, you have here, uh, member states have to come up and uh, uh, a strategic plan which has to be approved by, by the Commission. Uh, and the European Commission defines a range of acceptable intervention types and so on and so on. So uh, there's still uh, quite a bit of room in order to introduce CA in this. You see also uh, they call it now, but it's not actually uh, something very new. They uh, won't talk about greening and cross compliance anymore. They call it now new enhanced uh, conditionality. And what is actually really new, and this is if member states would define it as such, it's the ecosystem paid in pillar one, included in pillar one. And here, member states could define things that go beyond these enhanced, already enhanced conditionality. They could put it in the ecosystem into pillar one, which would be financed then 100% by the EU. So uh, this is actually, would be a tool, but there is no, unfortunately, there is no minimum that member states should allocate to this eco, eco scheme in pillar one. So it's still uh, an open question. Well, needs and ways forward. Well, I think we need to raise awareness that intensive tillage-based soil management is the root cause of soil degradation. I think this has to be uh, very, very clearly uh, outspoken. That rational science-based and responsible use is a must for all external inputs into, into crop production. Uh, we need big efforts to change mindsets uh, of farmers, and here farmers itself should help to speak to other farmers to try to convince. Uh, we need a favorable uh, policy and institutional environment <coughs> to mainstream CA, uh, and we must convince people that, uh, that uh, the it's not just the rejection or the, uh, of chemicals uh, or, or synthetic modern inputs um, that make uh, agriculture sustainable. It's much more. So because we really face the problem, and you all uh, know about the glyphosate issue, uh, it's really a crusade uh, against this. And uh, well, banning glyphosate uh, apparently uh, is equal to sustainable. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, scientific and empirical evidence must be produced and compiled to convince stakeholders and decision makers, of course. Uh, but also, we all are uh, well uh, committed to uh, to reduce uh, and to find alternatives or non-reduced, uh, non or reduced chemical weed control that would really help uh, to uh, to accept much more CA as the sustainable farming approach. Uh, well, we have to say that, uh, well, the answer lies in the soil, so we shouldn't treat it like dirt. Uh, we all know that agri uh, conservation agriculture uh, does better. Uh, you see here, it makes really the difference, uh, and it uh, makes the difference, actually. You can find this everywhere, and we just have to, to spread the, uh, the message uh, as strongly as we can. Uh, all over the world, you see here the uptake of CA. It's quite big in the Americas, but also in uh, Australia. But Europe has still a, a long, long way to go. Only around 2.8% of the area is under CA. So, thank you much, uh, very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope, well, if there are questions, please go ahead. And still, uh, before I close, really, I want to inform you about the, uh, this event, this upcoming in event in 2020, which is the eighth uh, World Congress on Conservation Agriculture, which we, uh, well, we've battled for being again in Europe. It's coming back now uh, again to Europe after, uh, well, 19 years then uh, after the first one in 2001. Okay, thanks a lot. <coughs> Uh, questions? 
Put your hands up if you have a question. Thank you very much, Gottlieb. Really interesting. Um, and it's, it's nice to get a pan-European perspective. Uh, you, of course, are a powerful advocate for conservation agriculture, but you don't really mention the integration of livestock with cropping. Now, we in this country have a very polarized agriculture. We tend to have a lot of arable farming in the east and a lot of livestock in the west. A lot of those livestock farms, especially dairy farms, are getting bigger and bigger. They are very big centers of potential nutrient pollution. Uh, would it not make sense, as well as advocating conservation agriculture, to advocate a much better integration of livestock and cropping? Well, uh, I agree fully uh, with you. Uh, fact is that uh, this crop livestock, uh, CA uh, livestock integration is very much advanced in other regions, like in Brazil, for example. They do a lot of this and have a lot of uh, results, very positive results already. Uh, there are not so many results so far in, uh, in Europe, I must say. Uh, I don't know, well, it, it depends also uh, on, the, on the way animals are produced uh, in Europe, mainly. But uh, there are regions where you have uh, animals outdoor and where, uh, of course, this integration between crop production and animals would be, would be a very positive uh, issue. But we, so far, did not uh, well, include this aspect of CA livestock in our, in our approaches. Uh, we, so far, we are lucky if we can uh, convince farmers to at least adopt CA. But uh, I agree fully with you that uh, CA and livestock integration would have very positive aspects. It can be a problem also, I must say, uh, especially under uh, southern European conditions, I speak for Portugal in this case, uh, where we uh, have a lot of uh, grazing uh, or in winter, in winter time. And if you, uh, well, in former times it was actually uh, very, very normal that uh, livestock would also uh, graze on, on uh, arable land. Uh, but as this is often happening uh, in winter, uh, the problem is uh, the very rainy winter months make the soil very, very wet. And if you are not very careful and uh, let the uh, cattle or, or sheep graze during very wet periods on arable land, then you have a, really a real problem with soil compaction. Uh, but I admit that there should be, there should be uh, ways forward, especially if you have a nice and permanent uh, uh, no-till field with uh, a lot of cover, then uh, uh, the bearing capacity uh, is much higher, and I think in this case uh, it would be perfectly uh, possible to get this good integration between uh, crop and livestock, uh, between uh, crop production on the CA and livestock. Uh, any more questions? No. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Lorna Davis, uh, landscape architect and Nuffield scholar. Um, I was wondering with regards to a very interesting talk, thank you very much, and um, certainly lots of food for thought. And that's really where my question comes in the, um, with regards to adopting ecosystem services to help to develop the reason as to why conservation, part of the package as to why conservation agriculture is going to be the way forward. How do you actually manage people's expectations over the time it's going to take to turn agriculture around to be able to deliver your approach? The increasing demand on food, which people are expecting, and actually the pressures from government to meet all of the urban public's expectations and not necessarily understand the rural public's ability to deliver if given time to do it. Well, uh, I'm not sure whether I got uh, completely your question, but I would say that well, uh, we, uh, our, our uh, 
effort is actually in convincing people that the approach of CA is the most promising one to match food production uh, with delivery of ecosystem services. The other ecosystem services, because food, product, uh, food production itself is an ecosystem service, correct? Uh, but I know that, uh, well, for uh, many, many, well, urban people, well, they, uh, why they do not understand, actually, the, the needs uh, farmers uh, feel to produce uh, food. They don't see the, the, the need for the stewardship. Uh, well, they need see the need for stewardship, but uh, they, they don't exactly know how to uh, correctly uh, steward the countryside, you see. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a tough job, and uh, while well, the consumers, uh, of course, they want cheap, good, and safe food. And, uh, well, everything uh, that is, uh, well, somehow associated to uh, chemical inputs, mineral inputs, is so well somehow well negatively associated, and uh, I think uh, there should be a, well must be a public affairs campaign uh, uh, to to well to uh, clarify to uh, people uh, on what r is real sustainable food production. This is an issue we are working on it, uh, but it, it's a hard fight. Tony Allen from Tony. King's College, thank you, Gottlieb, for a wonderful presentation. Um, can I just ask um, your perspective on, on Europe? Um, in the UK, um, uh, the uh, conservation agriculture is a disruptive process in terms of what we have, therefore it has these struggles. And there's no alignment at all in government. Government doesn't say, gee, um, CA is great. The corporates don't say CA is great. And because those two fund science, science doesn't say it's great. <laughs> we haven't had in the UK an Embrapa moment when the, the chief guy in Embrapa said, we're going we're gonna to follow, in fact, what they we're going to do is follow the farmers. We haven't had that event in this country. Is there anywhere in Europe where there's a sign that they have, perhaps in Spain? Or? Well, I think there are uh, some countries in Europe where, uh, where governments are listening uh, well, to scientists, of course, but where scientists are also uh, supporting CA. It's not, well, we know the experience here in UK. We, ha we had already uh, meetings with uh, representatives from DEFRA. Uh, it was, well, uh, last winter in, at, uh, at Tony Reynolds' farm. They invited a series of, of DEFRA people. They were very much delighted, apparently, apparently, but I don't know whether this is uh, able to be translated into taking up the idea and transmitting it to, uh, to policy makers. This is actually, but elsewhere there are, uh, is a strong support by scientists, I know it from Spain, I know it from Portugal, but also uh, in Italy for example. In Italy they did a wonderful job also to, uh, to come up with these agri-environmental measures and you saw uh, that uh, the uptake in the regions uh, where the decision makers were convinced of the benefits of CA was, was tremendous, actually. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dick Thompson. I'm here representing the British Society of Soil Science. Um, the Society has a new initiative called Working with Soil, which aims at ensuring that we have a, an adequate skills base in, in soil science and soil management. I'd be interested in your views on whether you, th you think there are any gaps in the skills base that was needed for the expansion of conservation agriculture, and if so, what they are. Uh, sorry, again, gaps in, in what exactly? In, in practical, s the practical skills of soil management that, that are needed for expanding conservation agriculture. Well, we all, all know and we are completely aware that uh, conservation agriculture is a very, very demanding, demanding uh, system. You need a lot of observation, you need uh, patience, you need uh, constant improvement. And, uh, well, I think knowledge is there, uh, but it's, 
has to be locally, locally adapted, the system. And uh, this is why, uh, well, the practical advice uh, should, should, be, uh, should come from uh, local farmer groups in order to uh, define and to identify these gaps. And, uh, well, if there are these gaps, uh, I, well, it could be uh, problems with, uh, well, diseases, with slugs, with, uh, there, uh, this is our uh, local problems that uh, come up, and to solve them, uh, well, of course, science can help, but often it's uh, the practitioners that uh, have the right solution, because some are more advanced, some experience problems earlier, uh, and, uh, well, there are uh, gaps, well, uh, real gaps, I would say. You can find solutions uh, everywhere, everywhere. Whether they are applicable to your condition, it's another thing. But uh, the system as such is uh, quite well uh, studied, but locally it has to be always adapted. And this is, uh, I would say, one of the biggest challenges uh, for the uptake of CA and also, of course, the mindset, the mindset of many, many farmers still, that, well, uh, this does not work on my farm. This is actually uh, the issue, and of course, if CA is uh, if started uh, not incorrectly, then, uh, well, people will, uh, well, uh, stop uh, immediately, and this has to be uh, really done carefully and with uh, some advice, especially, and this advice should really come from uh, well, fellow practitioners. Thank you so much, Gottlieb. Thank you very much. Thank you.